I'm Darren Schreiber. I'm a senior lecturer in politics at the University of Exeter. When I was an undergraduate, as you can see in this picture uh, here, I went to study politics and philosophy and economics in the United States. I read the research of scholars like Benjamin Skinner, uh, B.F. Skinner, uh, Adam Smith, John Locke, and I got a lot of ideas about human nature. I got ideas that we were the result of our behavior or that our nature was written upon a blank slate or that we were driven by self-interest and individual motivation. I learned all of these ideas. I read through this literature. I believed it, but I was wrong. A few years later, having finished university, I went to uh, law school and bored in a contracts class. I started reading work on the very first uses of functional brain imaging, um, the work by a researcher named Marcus Reichel, who was looking at people's brains while they were doing very basic cognitive tasks like conjugating verbs in a foreign language or doing mathematics or imagining the rotation of an object. And he studied people who had both practiced these tasks and were doing them for the first time. And he looked at the the pattern of brain activation when they were doing the task for the first time and after they'd done it quite a bit. And he saw dramatic differences in these people's brains. I worked as a lawyer for a few years, decided that wasn't what I wanted to be when I grew up, and went off to get a PhD in political science. And when I was studying political science, I learned that there was a lot of differences between people who knew a lot about politics and people who didn't know much about politics. And I started thinking, this is really similar to that work I'd read when I was a law student. I wonder if we could put people in a brain scanner and tell differences about their, the nature of their political cognition, just like Marcus Reichel had done by looking at their brains. So I talked to some people at the brain imaging department at UCLA where I was studying, and we devised an experiment where we got people who were members of the political clubs, the Republicans or the Democrats at UCLA, or people that didn't know very much about politics. And I asked them political questions and non-political questions to see if we could observe differences. My expectation was that there would be a lot of differences in a part of the brain known as the frontal lobe. Um, this is a part of the brain that has evolved over the last three million years massively uh, that really differentiates humans from many other species um, and is the result of a three million year cognitive arms race of having larger and larger brains, 100,000 new neurons per generation. And I thought that this would be the part of the brain that would be really active while we were thinking about our lives as in politics. But I was wrong. It turned out the research that I did showed that there were really big differences instead in a couple of areas that I'd never really thought about before, um, regions in the posterior medial cortices. What was interesting was that the Republicans and the Democrats had such similar patterns of brain activation, and they were increasing in the blood flow to these regions while the political novices were decreasing in these areas. This led me to think that perhaps Republicans and Democrats process the political world in exactly the same way, and maybe even had the same kind of patterns of brain activity, not really being able to differentiate it, the left from the right. But I was wrong, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, more in, in the remainder of this lecture. To understand the results that I did have, though, I returned to the work of Marcus Reichel, and I saw differences in work that Marcus Reichel had done when he was studying people who knew it, how to do a task versus when he compared them just laying in the scanner and subtracting out the brain activity when they were just laying in the scanner from when they were doing these cognitive activities. What Marcus Reichel had discovered was a pattern that he described as the default mode network, the part of the brain that's doing a lot of work when we're not doing anything. That default mode network turned out to be the same part of the regions of the brain that were active when my political sophisticates, when the people that knew a lot about politics were thinking about these political questions and comparing the, their brain activity to people who didn't know very much about politics. For people who were politically engaged then, the political club members, we saw brain activity increasing in these default mode network regions as if thinking about politics was a type of social cognition activity that it required them to be thinking about, the, about politics in the same kind of way we might think about uh, our office politics or our, our church politics or our family politics. But for political novices, there was a decrease in these same brain imaging area, these same brain regions that seemed to indicate that for political novices, the thinking about politics was a technical task, just like conjugating verbs in a foreign language or uh, imagining rotating an object in their minds or doing mathematics. I then started to believe that perhaps uh, thinking about politics was going to be a, a simple thing to study. But again, I was wrong. 
I reflected upon the results that I had, and it led me to start thinking about the work that argues for the social brain, the social brain hypothesis that talks about work uh, studying social cognition in a variety of, di of different animals, fish or ants or bees, many different kinds of animals have rich social lives. Um, they have uh, interactions among schools of fish or colonies of bees. But if you're an ant, your social life is actually quite simple. It really is a quite simple task to detect whether somebody is a friend or a foe because you can give them a little sniff and you can tell whether they have pheromones, chemical signals that are similar to yours or different from yours. That tells you whether somebody is a friend or a foe. Among these different social animals, however, there's a subset that I would describe as political animals, agreeing with Aristotle that man is by nature a political animal. But it's not just humans. It turns out that dolphins and elephants and hyenas and chimpanzees all tend to live incredibly complex social lives with interacting, shifting, coalitional dynamics that are the very core of their social interactions. Uh, if you look at dolphins, one dolphin might go swimming and hunting with another dolphin today, a different one tomorrow. And sometimes when I was living in San Diego, we'd see megapods of thousands of dolphins gathering for a one-time event and then dispersing never to meet up again. But as humans, our lives are not as simple as ants. We can't just go into a meeting, smell somebody and tell whether they're going to be a friend or a foe. We live in much more complex social uh, interactions than uh, animals like uh, ants or bees um, or fish. To study this a little bit more, I looked at the brain activity of people while they were engaging in gambling activities, while they were making decisions to uh, take a risk or not take a risk. I had an idea that this would uh, be a fairly simple thing to study, that we would get direct, uh, in easily interpretable results, and I didn't really expect to see too much differences, too many differences between the Republicans and Democrats while they were gambling, but again, I discovered I was wrong. Their behaviors, it turned out, were actually indistinguishable. You couldn't go to Las Vegas or to Monte Carlo and discern whether somebody was liberal or conservative simply by looking at their behavior, which is what B.F. Skinner had been leading me to think was the key variable in understanding human uh, activity, was looking at the behaviors. Here, the behaviors of the Republicans and Democrats were exactly the same when they were taking these risks. This led me to think that, well, maybe we weren't gonna find anything. But again, I was wrong. When we looked at the brain activity of the people, even though they were making the same exact decisions, we found dramatic differences in the pattern of brain activity that allowed us to correctly classify someone as either a Republican or a Democrat with 83% accuracy. This was just mind blowing because we knew from studies going back to the 1950s that if you look at someone's parents and identify whether their parents are Republicans or Democrats, you can classify their children with about 69% accuracy as being either a Republican or a Democrat. So if we could see whether someone was a Republican or a Democrat with 69% accuracy by looking at their parents and then studying their brains told us with 83% accuracy, this was really shocking because of how much we know about you by understanding some things about your parents. The traditional models of political science had been that we got our politics from our parents as we encounter the world here and that perhaps those party affiliations were gonna be uh, altering the way that we think about the world. But newer work was suggesting that perhaps it was related to genetics. And maybe that was the solution to understanding this was that we could just look at genetics and figure out whether someone was a Republican or a Democrat and understand that through the lens of genetics. But again, I realized I was wrong. The results we had were simply too strong. You get all of your DNA from your mom or your dad, and the fact that we could not that we could see bigger differences by looking purely at brain activation was telling us that there was some kind of interaction between the environmental influences of the parents, the genetics, and the way that the individual was making choices that altered how their brain was functioning. I had been trained, like many other people, to think of the brain as kind of like a computer circuit board, that we had hardwired behaviors that were determined by either our environment or perhaps by our genetics. But again, I was wrong. The digging into this line of research has led me to believe that in fact we're hardwired not to be hardwired. That the world that we live in is so complicated with so many shifting constant coalitions, changing and morphing dynamic or, uh, interactions that led me to believe that in fact we're hardwired not to be hardwired. We live in a world 
where there's a lot of conflict, a lot of protests. Sometimes this can get frustrating or upsetting to see. But one of the great insights from this line of research is that while we do have a tendency to form coalitions and to have conflict with each other, in fact, it's not that difficult to get people to cooperate, to get people to work together, to get people to care about each other, to love each other, to cross party lines, to cross race lines, cultural lines, to get them to work together to solve problems and to cooperate. We have a brain that is built for politics, but we're hardwired not to be hardwired. And this gives me a lot of hope for our future.